So good afternoon. I'm Irene Harold, and I'm the Dean of the Library at Keene State College in New Hampshire. Obviously. <laughs> the great state of New Hampshire that now has its top delegation to the um, Congress and Senate. Women. It has its governor. A woman. Part of this is my work with Vision 2020, which is not the healthy city Vision 2020, but Vision 2020, which is about women and equality. It's a national referendum. And my work was to promote the Doris Granny D. Haddock collection and her work, highlighting her work in registering working women and minorities to vote. So that was sort of my own personal stake in all of this and in, in this work. But the uh, Granny D lecture really came out of the desire to honor the institutions that wanted to have the Doris Granny D Haddock collection at their libraries. They couldn't, we can't all have it, <laughs> only one of us could, and Keene State was the delighted recipient of the materials that Jim Haddock donated to us in honor of his mother, and that Ruth Meyer who is with us today with her husband, Del, was keeping in their house, all over their house. <laughs> so my archivist, Rodney Obian, who actually is presenting at a national conference in North Carolina and can't be with us today, went to her house and picked them up box by box by box and brought the material physically to Mason Library. In addition to a climate-controlled, secured environment, they wanted to make sure that the Doris Granny D. Haddock collection was available not just to the campus community of Keene State, but to all scholars and the whole community. So in keeping with that, we have finding aids and we are slowly digitizing some of the materials to make them accessible. So last January, keeping the lecture idea that Ruth planted in my head, I asked to convene a meeting with Antioch University, New England, with Keene Public Library, with Keene High School Library, and with Franklin Pierce University. I was unable to make my own meeting. <laughs> but they met and talked about if we were going to do a lecture in honor of Doris and her work, when would be the best time for it? And I know there was some desire to have it around Doris's birthday in January, but that's just not really great timing for academic institutions. It's either we're on break or it's right before the break is, um, has ended and our students couldn't engage. So the group in its wisdom said let's do it after the election. Luckily, we had a scholar, Dr. Margaret Peggy Walsh, who's with us today and will be speaking in a few moments, who was doing research this summer using the collection and had done a presentation, and my archivist alerted me to that, and I said, oh, I've got someone <laughs> <laughs> who can do the lecture. So I contacted my esteemed colleagues, three of whom are here. So Marcy Leversy, just wait, Marcy, from Antioch University, New England, and Nancy Vinson, who's the director of Keene Public Library, and Kelly Budd, who's the director at Keene High School Library, and unfortunately, Carissa, whose last name escapes me at this moment. Thank you, Delicio. Could, thank you for being here. Could not be here. She is away on vacation, but we have representatives from Franklin Pierce. Thank you, thank you. And um, we got together and we said, this is great. So what we decided to do would have one institution provide the scholar and another of the collaborating institutions host the event. So we're hoping this will rotate among the five institutions so any of you who have a scholarly bent, come on over and work with the collection and materials. But we're very excited by this opportunity and this collaboration among the five institutions. Let me spend just a moment introducing our speaker. So Dr. Margaret Walsh is a professor and the director of the College Honors Program at Keene State College. She teaches sociology, research methods, experiential learning for students in the major. She collaborates with community leaders on academic service learning projects with local impact in social problems, sociology of families, and social stratification courses. 
Since 2004, she's been leading trips to Nicaragua with students, faculty, and staff to learn about social and economic uh, conditions in its post-revolutionary period. Cultural partnerships have also brought Nicaraguan dancers and musicians to New Hampshire as an outgrowth of this. She participates in national and professional, or national educational and professional conferences, but I think what spoke most to me is that she has done intense research on rural poverty and agenda setting, looking at it in New Hampshire and then working with national groups in Washington, D.C. She researches and writes about rural education is issues and family well-being. She's a long-standing member of the New England Sociological Association, has served on its executive council, as well as the Eastern Sociological Society's book award and undergraduate committees. She also co-chaired Keene State College's 100th Centennial um, Creating a World of Possibilities campus celebrations. So without further ado, to hear how Doris not only inspired other generations, but inspired Peggy. I welcome you to the podium. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? No. I don't think it's on. Say no. Yeah, do say no if you can't hear me. Otherwise, what's the point, right? Is that better? No. No. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here, and uh, thank you to Irene and to Ruth and to the committee who created the, the opportunity for us all to get together during election week to think about the implications of Doris Haddock's life and her work. It's really been a pleasure for me, and I'm just so happy to be here. So the title of my talk is Inspiring the Next Generation, and it's also kind of subtitled Activism at 90 or Any Age. <laughs> An activist is a person who's passionate about their beliefs and helps educate other people about the subject. Do you know the activists in your community today? Are they here today? I know probably 20 or so, 30 are. What's the process of becoming active? I have long admired Ethel Doris Rollins Haddock. Our students have learned about her commitment to social justice and her amazing walk from California to Washington, D.C. I teach courses on social stratification and inequalities at Keene State College. And last spring, my students and I read the work of another original thinker, writer Jane Jacobs, who was born just a few years later, and she herself lived to age 90. Her book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, is a classic study of urban life. That book influenced Mitch Dunnier, who wrote Sidewalk, a chronicle of the lives of people on the streets of Greenwich Village in New York. And as I was listening to my students discuss the concept of the public character, how we all inhabit our public spaces, it turned my thoughts to Granny D. The idea is that social life depends on self-appointed public characters anyone who's in steady contact with a wide circle of people, all ages, ethnicities, religions, and people who are interested to make himself or herself into a public figure. In Dunier's words, quote, he need not have special talents or wisdom to fulfill that function, although he often does. He just needs to be present regularly and to have enough counterparts to converse with. His main qualification is that he's out there talking to lots of people every day. In this way, news travels that is of interest and important to many others. If we change the he to she, we have Granny. Jacobs patterned her idea of the public character after store owners in her neighborhood where people would leave their spare keys but she also modeled it on people like herself, who distributed petitions on local political issues to neighborhood stores, spreading local news in that process. 
Jacobs did not define her concept narrowly, except to say, it's anyone who's sufficiently interested to make himself or herself known. What I think Jacobs meant was that society is shaped by the presence of people behaving in public. Her actions make life better, safer, stabler, more predictable, and also lively and interesting in a city. And she goes on to explain, this occurs because the public character has eyes on the street. Well, we understood in my class that public characters were part of urban neighborhoods, but we wondered whether there might be an equivalent for rural communities. People whose eyes were open, perceptive, steady, and eager to engage neighbors in conversation. That's what led me to the social justice archives at Keene State College. So in this region, where many towns are 5,000, 3,000, 1,000, or less, <laughs> is it possible to be a public character? What would that look like? What if there aren't any sidewalks? We know that. <laughs> what if there's only one general store, and its name is Cars, as in Dublin? <laughs> what if the key to being a public character is not the place, but the person? The life lessons contained in the archives tell us a detailed and interesting story of a 20th century woman who influences a new generation of 21st century citizens. Some of what I'll say today about Doris's biography is not new to you if you're here today as her friends or neighbors or the Tuesday Academy. But over the last several months, as I have talked to her, with, talked about her with my friends in Peterborough and Dublin and Keene, I've come to realize that many recognize her photo. She's pretty recognizable. But most do not know enough about her impact. So I'd like to highlight some key points of her life story that I believe are instructive for the next generation. As a woman born in 1910, Doris Rollins married young and raised a family while working in a shoe factory. By that description, she appears similar to so many rural New England women of her generation. That she lived to 100 is surely distinctive. That she became a public figure at the age of 90 by walking 3,200 miles across the United States to raise awareness about the need for national campaign finance reform, ran for US Senate, and then made headlines by registering working women to vote, as Irene explained, around the country is exceptional. So what I'll do today is develop briefly three themes. First, the early life story that led to the public character we know as Granny D. Second, think about the habits and feelings that lead us to take action, regardless of age. And third, give some examples of younger activists walking their own roads to social change, including students. Doris was born to a working class family in a tiny town in the Lakes region of New Hampshire. She had acting talents, a quick mind, and a ferocious sense of humor, but went to work in a factory, the Scott and William Silk Stocking Loom Factory in Laconia, because the cost of college was out of reach. Most American families earned less than $750 a year, only $275 for farm families, and her father, who had built their home himself, worked in a furniture warehouse. From a very young age, Doris was adept at memorizing poetry, songs, and speeches. And she wasn't shy. <laughs> Sometimes she felt different from the other kids, but she later said, quote, she courageously embraced those things that once made her apart or ashamed. Those were the very things she felt brought her success. Both she and her mother expected her to find success in the theater, probably on Broadway, and definitely not Hollywood. At 18, Doris was encouraged by a male friend to hop a train south to Boston, and he'd help her find lodging in a Somerville home. Sounds suspicious to many parents, right? Mm. It was pouring rain when she arrived. There's a photo of Doris in her best coat with fur trim that she discovered when wet turned out to be perhaps made of skunk. 
She found a job serving food at the dining hall at Harvard University. It was 1928. She made easy friends with these young, privileged, educated men who shared books and ideas and occasionally the ballroom dance floor with her. She was acquiring some social capital and she was already aware of power in relationships. Doris probably didn't know this, but right at that same moment, a sociology department was being born at Harvard University with new ideas about social differentiation and social stratification. Potemkin Sorokin's work distinguished between familistic relationships, which are warm and close and nurturing, and the relationship that has the most solidarity, the ones we like, <laughs> compared to the more limited and specific contractual relationships of acquaintances and associates and the marketplace. Sorokin also published about the existence of a social hierarchy consisting of upper and lower strata and an unequal distribution of wealth, power, and influence. While there's always some mobility between these strata, people move up or down the social hierarchy, acquiring or losing that power and influence, the concentration of wealth in 1928, as Doris Haddock remembered, was that people were using their political muscle to have their income taxes knocked down more each year, and that 1% of Americans owned 40% of the wealth. Before long, Doris showed up in the admissions office at Emerson College of Oratory in the Back Bay of Boston, where she wanted to study acting. Her friend Alan drew a map for her to get to Huntington Avenue because she was stalling. I think she was a little anxious about the whole thing. Her plan was to attend night classes and work at Harvard by day. Instead, she was asked on the spot to read from Shakespeare. I think she had to memorize it, but she already knew it well from pretty top-notch Laconia schooling. And she was accepted immediately as a day student by the Dean of Admissions, who was a woman, with a tuition scholarship a paid evening job sewing theater costumes, and summer employment at the home of a wealthy alum in Nantucket. Imagine this good fortune dropped in the lap of a young adult today by someone who's not their parent. <laughs> so it makes you wonder who's walking across the nation for tuition reform, but we'll get to that a little bit later. <laughs> Living on her own and moving among different worlds, the social scene of students and artists in urban Boston, as well as the farm and factory life of New Hampshire, brought Doris an appreciation for fashion, passion, and a fondness for friends and family. She was so happy traipsing around the city, finding fabric, sewing, and designing costumes. She didn't actually know how to sew when she took the job, but she nodded and was hired. <laughs> And she took courses in expression and elocution, and of course we know these skills came in quite handy later. Socially, in the 1920s, many upper-class Bostonians were turning attention inward. They were in their brownstones, hosting parties and card games at home, often with the wireless as entertainment. But the summer crowd still migrated to the sea in May, and they could afford help. It was also the first time Doris recalled ever having a conversation with an African-American person, a widowed woman with two children who worked side by side with her in the kitchen. Now Doris met her, first, her, her future, her first, her only, <laughs> her future husband when he was a lifeguard and she was a housekeeper. They became serious quickly, but she grappled with the idea of marriage. Several of her close friends, Ramona, Vera, and Bobby, tried to discourage her, knowing it would be the end of both college and career. And a line that appears in, in, much of, in much of what's been written about Doris is that married women could not attend Emerson, which was true. When she wed her Amherst College graduate, Jim Haddock, and moved back to her family's home in New Hampshire, her mother refused to take her in. She was gravely upset that Doris had given up on a college degree and her acting talent by choosing to marry instead. And it was now the Depression. The couple lived with Doris's husband's family. She gave birth to two children. And there's little else known about her mothering and domestic life, except that she and her husband both held jobs, 
first unsteadily and then later securely. We were educated and optimistic, she said. We didn't feel we were poor, she wrote. While that might sound trite in some circumstances, it's poignant for her. Education became a vehicle for social relationships that really made things happen. She was constantly in the process of becoming active. She continued to perform theater, public readings, in her distinctive drama school accent, and she educated other people, her neighbors, her friends, about what she knew. She took children, her children on long hiking and camping trips. She taught cross-country skiing, and she made friends with people like Elizabeth and Max Foster, who were voracious readers, writers, doers, and conversationalists. Doris wrote that their friendship was a lifelong academic partnership, a fellowship. And she recommended that we all find friends full of insight and information and a joyful spirit. The Fosters actually built a haven for artists and philosophers up in the Jackson area of New Hampshire, up north, much like the McDowell Colony uh, in Peterborough. So Doris's husband, Jim, was a meter reader for the electric company, and, she, and Doris herself managed a shoe factory. Historians tell us that New Deal projects and other government initiatives rooted people at home during this decade. People, especially white women, stayed put and stayed in during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s as the number of suburban homeowners and the number of automobiles increased. I imagine that Doris might have become a mommy blogger if the technology was invented during those decades. In her memoir, she offered these thoughts on child rearing, quote, parents must be careful to imprint upon their children the idea that each child is loved and special and worth attention. Somewhere deep in the subconscious, we unquestioningly believe our parents and accept their opinion of us. That opinion, good or bad, becomes the blueprint of our lives. She went on to describe the importance of a positive self, the first half of good parenting and grandparenting. Then, building self-reliance, character, and empathy by gradually and thoughtfully expanding their participation in responsible duties. By character, she said, I mean the ability to follow through with the resolution long after the mood of the moment has passed. A child can survive even when this is all done poorly by the parents, but it takes a great deal of self-repair work. I suppose Doris lived what she wrote because her adult children seemed very close to her. One lived nearly next door, her son Jim, who many of you know, uh, knew well, um, and he was an advocate for uh, people with developmental disabilities and special needs and her daughter, a psychiatrist in Boston. Doris wrote in her journal daily about all sorts of things. That habit provided a structure for her thoughts and a blueprint for action. At 50, Doris and her husband became involved in protesting nuclear testing in Alaska after learning about the Inuit fishing village that was to be destroyed in the process. In the archives, you'll find a self-published volume by P.V. Foster, the son of Elizabeth and Max, described, in his own words, as a feckless youth, <laughs> who drove with the Haddocks in a crowded minibus, five people plus a big dog, through Canada and Alaska in the fall of 1960. During the trip, incidentally, Doris was quite ill with pneumonia, and she was eventually hospitalized as her fever rose. Characteristically, she kept going, but upon her return to New Hampshire, she was ordered to take, quote, one blissful, workless week at home before returning to the BB Shoe Company. And after she did go back, she wasn't allowed to bring work home with her for a whole week. <laughs> Doris's work life and routine sound very contemporary to me, don't they? Uh, to you? Just like women we know and love today who are constantly going and caring and doing every once in a while, needing a day in pajamas to recover. I haven't said much about Doris's husband, Jim Haddock, but here's one small insight. At the end of the Alaska nuclear excavation campaign, the group celebrated with champagne, which apparently was his favorite drink, 
raising a glass to Jim, quote, a man who, when he sees an unfair blow about to be struck, will step in to parry it. A man who, when he has passed the ball, can be relied on to carry it. Here's to Jim, who spiked the wheels of Project Chariot. After retiring in 1972 from Manchester to Dublin, Doris kept her community involvement to serving on the town planning board. She still loved to walk and ski, but she felt restless after spending years caring for her, as she put it at the time, always dying mother-in-law, and her husband Jim, who suffered a, a, a long battle with Alzheimer's. While not outspoken about her political views, at least by today's standards, she had been reading a lot and was concerned about macro problems, big problems, such as the way national campaigns were funded. She started a petition with her friends in the Tuesday Academy and gained notoriety by walking 10 miles a day for 14 months, giving speeches and radio interviews along the way with all kinds of people joining her, sometimes for a mile, sometimes for many, and ending her trek in Washington, D.C. That's how she became an advocate for reform nationally known. And the archive, of course, contains so many letters from people like John McCain and Dennis Kucinich, but also a large uh, cadre of politicians and everyday folks. Rural communities have fewer easily identifiable public characters, but Doris Haddock, who was now Granny D, attracted artists, environmentalists, feminists, and walkers and wanderers. She took an interest in their ideas, their points of view, she accepted their tattoos and their piercings. She encouraged their sense of adventure and gave them books to read, just as the Harvard boys did for her 80 years prior. During her last few years of life, she gave a room in her home to a young woman named Blue Braxton who helped her with sorting through mail and organizing her files. Maybe she was helping to do that repair work for people who needed a surrogate parent. Doris gave dozens, maybe hundreds, of speeches to colleges and universities. She offered a lot of pep talks and advice. At Penn, she emphasized the need for creating peace at home and in the world. And this is an excerpt. Peace in any family requires fairness, kindness, honesty, shared financial and physical security, with a positive and creative view of the future for each individual and respect for the land that sustains us. When those basic conditions are not present, happiness fails and bad things begin to happen. Peace on any planet requires the same conditions. At Franklin Pierce University, she told students to study hard, yet, she said, there's one area where you are already the expert and where the professors and the other old birds are not. Young people, she said, bring something special. Be aware of this superior quality. Don't unknowingly waste it. Trust your sensibilities towards justice and fairness, towards the environment and peace. Doris's speeches tell us to cultivate both familistic and contractual relationships, to have a personal and a public life. And youth are listening. During her walk and afterwards, people of all ages entrusted their hearts to her, she wrote. She was out there in public, not tied to one sidewalk or one city or town, but on the road. This email appears in her book. I'm a college student, Catherine A. Wolf wrote to her from Austin, Texas, and your walk gives me renewed hope for our country and encouragement for me to take my own chances and make my own adventures and not to be afraid. So that was about 12 years ago. It took me only a minute or two of Googling to find out that that former student is now a reporter at Politico. <laughs> In the book Grassroots by Jennifer Baumgardner and Amy Richards, they stress the power and responsibility of the individual. The concepts of public service, giving back, or activism, they say, are not the exclusive domain of any generation, gender group, or political party. They encourage everyone to believe that they have the right and the power to take matters into our own hands. Every generation has its own specific vision of what it means to be an activist. Jane Addams, Cesar Chavez, Molly Ivins, 
Rosa Parks, MLK, Gloria Steinem, Granny D. <laughs> Along with writers such as Howard Zinn and Jonathan Kozal, were featured in a children's book, Americans Who Tell the Truth, and a copy is in the archives. In Letters to a Young Activist, author Todd Gitlin questions how young people can organize in a world where all they hear about is how the 60s were the pinnacle of activism. How can you not feel preempted, diminished even, by your parents and your teachers sitting around the proverbial campfire retelling, not for the first time, their anti-war <laughs> stories, nothing you can do about your date of birth after all, so you're trapped. The 60s, like parents, are useful but also oppressive. Fortunately, sociologists are doing ethnographic research on the topic. Uh, Andriana Clay, for example, found that teens had trouble thinking of themselves as activists because they were not doing enough. Yet one young woman was the president of her Gay Straight Alliance, a key organizer in mobilizing support for a youth center at her school, and the leader of a student walkout protest of the US invasion of Iraq in 2003. The student she interviewed, though, thought an ideal activist was someone who has enough resources to participate fully in the struggle for change. For example, a student said, quote, it's someone out there protesting and just doing more things like with Young People United, a program at her high school, we're focusing on getting a youth center, and we haven't been doing much else, except some people went to the state capitol to protest the budget cuts. But I don't know. I, I feel like an activist is someone who spends all of their time trying to change stuff. <laughs> I don't think I give enough time doing stuff to call myself an activist, she said. Baumgartner and Richards, though, are reassuring. Of course, being active involves time and sacrifice and hard work, like building a house rather than just living in the old one you inherited. But at least you have, to st you have a start and a foundation already. Call yourself a volunteer, an environmentalist, a good friend. It doesn't really matter. Translate politics into action. Get past the point, they say, of asking someone else, what can I do in the face of injustice, a natural disaster, an election, an interesting course, and find your own motivation. They say unite people, start a petition, table, boycott, occupy, anything. It's the very idea behind the sometimes maligned but very popular youth website, dosomething.org. One student at Keene State, Hannah Walker, who worked with the Granny D archives uh, last spring in a course with Dr. Patricia Pedrosa, published a letter in the Equinox. She said that the United States had reached many milestones in the past 60 years, quote, from the passage of the Civil Rights Act in its attempts to equalize the job playing field for women, people of color, and other minority groups. And she noted the hard work and lifetime dedication of activists and educators, and yes, even college students, who have historically formed the backbone of many social justice issues. She also argued that the mainstream image of college students is wrong. They're viewed, she said, quote, as money suckers and time wasters, the worst of humanity. That's how she felt. Rampant consumerism, social networking, and the Jersey Shore are all used as evidence of the disengagement of 20-somethings from the political process. On a more positive note, she turns her letter to say this, our activism is different from our parents and our grandparents. Picket lines are now replaced by online petitions and door-to-door -door distribution of pamphlets with tweeting and blogging and sharing links with friends via Facebook. She goes on, technological activism has been criticized in many activist circles, maybe rightly so. As with any expansion and exploration of a new medium, to distribute information and social engagement, the internet has had its failures and successes. It's a baby still, and there remains massive room for improvement. However, it should not be dismissed as an irrelevant site of civic engagement, nor as simply a fad. These forms of communication are here to stay. It's now our job to use it to the best of our abilities. 
So Hannah felt the ridicule and dismissive, dismissiveness based on her age. She was called naive, because, but she knows that she's a powerful force in the political system, as shown in the move to restrict college students' voting rights with voter ID laws, to turn a blind, a blind eye toward the rising level of student debt and tuition hikes that will restrict access to education. We old birds, how do you feel about that label? <laughs> Need to be made aware of the outside forces affecting younger adults. Knowing what you believe and understanding who you are is perhaps the best start to being active. Granny D said, you don't learn unless you are active and actively engaged. Hannah is saying the same thing. Sometimes people need concrete examples. Doris Haddock became a living example of something you can do, and some recent activists continue to offer specific instructions, specific advice, by doing things like this, handing over their weekly planners to the next generation. So an intern can see exactly how an activist uses his or her time every day. What counts as work? Is there time to have a pet? <laughs> Is there time to go for a swim? or sleep six or even eight hours a night. Granny D's schedule was also important to her. She wanted to get her walking done early in the day, whether she was on training uh, for her walk or afterwards. And she was aware and attentive to her physical strengths and limits. Not unlike these millennials, she was journey focused. She cared deeply about her friends. Without them, she said, you'll have no luck. Her great adventure gave her time to think about her life and to finally see things in one connected view. She wrote, she spoke, she listened to people who felt they had no access, no one to vote for, no one to listen to them. Doris was a citizen, she took an issue and she walked it out. She needed a reason to live at one point, she said, and it was her country that gave it to her. And finally, the very act of doing something difficult impresses people. <laughs> so thank you. And those are the end of my that, you know, those are the end of my prepared remarks. But Granny D preferred to speak using written notes, and I, I agree with her. I wanted to make sure that I was able to you know reflect her words. Um, I do believe that it would be very important for us today to have a discussion about anything you've heard so far and also some of your own recollections and, um, and thoughts about the impact on the, new, on the new generation, the next generation, and the work that Granny D did. So thank you all. Mm -hmm.